Heat Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. At this time, I would request that everyone please turn off or mute all cell phones and other electronic devices. Also, I'd, I would ask everyone to please stand with me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Thank you. Applications for our temporary fireworks stands heard during tonight's meeting will be voted on by the Planning and Zoning Commission. The vote on these temporary fireworks stands will be final. Only a recommendation for denial will be heard by the County Council at their Monday, June 12, 2023 meeting. Applications for conditional use permit requests heard during tonight's meeting will be voted on by the commission and the commission will make a recommendation to the county council. The applications will then be scheduled to be introduced before the county council at their Monday, June 12th, 2023 county council meeting. Public comment for conditional use permit requests will be taken during tonight's meeting and at the county council meeting on Monday, June 12th, 2023. Public comment on conditional use permit applications will not, will not be taken at any meeting of the County Council held thereafter. The following documents are introduced as a matter of record for this evening's public hearing and regular meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Those documents are the Unified Development Ordinance of St. Charles County, including zoning maps, the year 2030 Master Plan for St. Charles County, which includes the year 2030 Future Land Use Plan Map, the rules of order and procedure for the Planning and Zoning Commission as adopted by Resolution 21-01 and the 2023 Fireworks Stands Regulations of St. Charles County. I see we have a quorum. Is there a motion to open the meeting? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor sign aye. 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 Okay. Um, a brief description is how we conduct our meetings. Uh, I will uh, read into the record um, uh, the application. Uh, the staff will give their report. Uh, we may may, uh, may not have questions for staff. Then we'll have to ask the applicant to come forward and present their application, answer any questions that the commission may have. Um, and then we will open the uh, uh, public hearing on that application. Okay. Anyone wishing to speak regarding the application can come forward. I will have to swear you in. This is a public hearing. Um, then once the uh, public hearing is closed, we will not take any further comments from the public. We'll ask the applicant to come back to address any questions that may have, have arisen during the uh, public hearing portion. Uh, and then the commission will um, take a, consider the application and vote. If you're going to speak, we ask you to fill out one of these cards. They're right there on the corner. This way we ensure that we get your name correct in the, uh, in, in the minutes. Um, there are, are no changes or additions to the agenda. However, I will say that the zoning map amendment request, uh, 24 Main Street, uh, which is RZ23-05, and the conditional use permit amendment request, 24 Main Street, which is CUP23-04. Uh, these are both by Boschert Brothers Storage, LLC. Those are shown on our agenda as uh, continued items, and they will remain continued items. So if anyone here regarding those, uh, those will be continued to the uh, June meeting. Okay. <coughs> First on the agenda is the temporary fireworks stand conditional use permit located at 3494 North Highway 94. The application is FWK 23-09. Property owner is Frederick T. Dreyer Trust. Uh, the applicant is Dennis Thibault. Uh, the zoning is I-2, heavy industrial district. The location is uh, located on the east side of North Highway 94, approximately 880 feet north of Joyce Drive near the city of St. Charles. This is located in Council District 6. Staff. Okay. <clears throat> so this is a um, temporary fireworks stand that was there last year as well. Uh, staff <coughs> has received no complaints or any concerns about this uh, permit. Uh, staff recommends uh, the conditions of uh, the proposed use shall substantially comply with the attached concept plan 
and that the temporary conditional use shall comply with all 2023 fireworks stand regulations as adopted by the County Planning and Zoning Commission on March 15th, 2023. Okay. Any questions for staff? Hearing none, we'll ask the applicant to come forward. Please raise your right hand. You solemnly swear or affirm that you will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in these proceedings under the pains and penalties of perjury. Yes, sir. Please state your name and address for the record. Dennis Tebow, 3127 Elm Street, St. Charles, Missouri. Okay. <clears throat> Anyone have any questions for Mr. Tebow? Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> we will now open the public hearing for temporary fireworks uh, stand conditional use permit FWK 23-09. Anyone here wishing to speak? Anyone wishing to speak regarding this application? Seeing no one, we'll close the public hearing. Um, bring this application back to the commission. Any questions for the applicant? Any questions for staff? Hearing none, the chair will entertain a motion to approve uh, temporary fireworks stand conditional use permit uh, FWK 23-09. Is there a motion? So moved. Ms. Clary made the motion. So is there a Second. Means? Um, do, 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 where are we at here? Ms. Barr made the second. Uh, Mr. Baker, how do you vote? Favor. Uh, Mr. Cornwell? Yes. Uh, Mr. Fromm? Yes. Mr. Shell? Yes. Mr. Kuchner? Yes. Uh, where am I at here? Uh, Mr. Clary? Yes. Uh, Ms. Bauer? Yes. And I vote yes. Okay, that passes. Next item on our agenda is temporary fireworks stand conditional use permit located at 1429 Granville Drive. Application is FWK 23-10. Property owners Gerald A. Bomer and Judy A. Bomer Family Partnership LP. The applicant is Show Me Fireworks LLC, Marty Fears. Zoning is C2 General Commercial District. The location is uh, 2,550 feet south of Timber Trace Drive along Highway 61 adjacent to the city of Wentzville and located in Council District 1. Staff. So there's been a temporary fireworks stand at this location since 2021. Staff has not received any comments, questions, or concerns on this particular location. Um, staff would recommend uh, a similar set of conditions. Uh, the proposed use shall substantially comply with the attached concept plan, and the temporary conditional use shall comply with all 2023 fireworks stand regulations as adopted by the County Planning and Zoning Commission on March 15th of 2023. Any questions for staff? Hearing none, we'll ask the applicant to come forward. I don't see Mr. Fears here. Um, we will now open the uh, public hearing for FWK 23-10, which is a temporary fireworks stand conditional use permit located at 1429 Granville Drive. Anyone wishing to speak regarding this application? Anyone? Seeing no one, we will close the public hearing bring this application back to the commission for consideration. Any questions, concerns? Hearing none, the chair will entertain a motion to approve FWK 23-10. So moved. Mr. Fromm made the motion. Is there a second? Second. Ms. Clare made the second. Mr. Cornwell? Yes. Uh, Mr. Fromm? Yes. Uh, Mr. Shell? Yes. Ms. Kuchner? Yes. Uh, Ms. Barr? Yes. Mr. Baker? Yes. Uh, Mr. Clary? Yes. And I vote yes. Okay. Uh, next item on our agenda is conditional use permit request located at 2334 Mexico Road. The application is CUP 22-07. Property owners are Jacob Matchling, did I get it right? And Gwen Matchling. Uh, applicant <coughs> is uh, Highlander Farm. Uh, the current zoning is A Agricultural District and conditional use request is Rural Recreational Activity for a Seasonal Youth Farm Camp. Uh, the location is 200 feet west of Tuscany Lane on the north side of Mexico Road adjacent to the city of Wentzville. This is located in Council District 1. Staff. The application is for a Rural Recreational Activity which um, County Ordinance defines as a permanent or seasonal commercial activity drawing clients or customers to a rural property, either for such recreational purposes as 
picking produce for purchase, like pick your own apple orchards or pumpkin farms, for example, visiting <coughs> pumpkin patches or corn mazes or petting farms, taking sleigh or hag ha um, hay wagon rides. Uh, that's our definition for a rural recreational activity. So the applicants are applying for um, <coughs> what I would describe it as like a kid's farm camp or children's farm camp for farm-related or life science <coughs> education. Mm -hmm. And um, it'd be operated for up to 100 children for two months annually. And additionally, they're looking to provide other educational activities for three months annually. That's basically the gist of the application. Um, concerning the farm camp, uh, up to 100 children are proposed to gather on weekdays during the months of June and July. And participants are to be divided into three to four groups with three camp counselors assigned to each group. And there's uh, details on how this would work in terms of the organization. Um, they've explained well how they would organize the farm camps and run the farm camp. No permanent structures are proposed. Uh, temporary facilities would include a 20 by 40 foot open sided tent, portable toilets and hand washing or sanitizing stations. Participants would each day bring their own lunch and bottle water and then parents would drop off kids each morning at set staggered, set staggered times to avoid cars backing up on the Mexico road. The other educational activities for up to 50 participants would take place in May, August, or temp September, but it's not really well defined on what those activities would be. Uh, and it's a little unclear to me whether they would actually be rural recreational activities. I'm not really sure about that. The property currently has a single family residence and several accessory structures on the front of the property in New Mexico Road. So access is from Mexico Road and there's a one lane circular drive that's about 175 feet deep. So one lane as in one car wide. And so as I understand it, the applicants have uh, parents drop off kids, line up their cars along this driveway and kind of synchronize. I kind of think of it like synchronized swimming. You know, you have to do everything all perfectly all at once and then you drop off, pick up the kids. And then the next group comes in and a little bit later, and that's how they um, are intending to make this work. In terms of the land use context, um, use of the property is single family residential rather than a farm. And it's, as I view it, it's located within a suburban rather than a rural context. Um, the, the lot is relatively narrow for an agricultural lot. It's 200 feet wide and over 1,000 feet long. So it meets the minimal lot size but it's relatively narrow and how, where that comes into play, there's a subdivision developed bordering on the west side and the, there's five homes with very shallow lots and the homes themselves are only about 40 feet from the, the rear property line. So the activities that are being proposed are only gonna be about 50 feet away from those homes themselves. And then on the east side of the property, there's one home and I think it's about 25 feet from the property line. So there'll be activities over there. Now how they intend to address that in part is that they're proposing to install vegetative buffers along both sides. And that would certainly address visual impacts, but it's not gonna address noise. And that, that can be a concern. On the other hand, it's only proposed for two months out of the year <laughs> during the summer months. So that needs to be weighed as well. Uh, so, we, the um, county has established um, several criteria for how to judge conditional use permits and to determine whether or not, essentially they can be good neighbors, um, either as proposed or conditioned, or can they, are the land use impacts <coughs> too great and should it be denied? So those conditions are, those criteria are, first, would establishing, maintaining, operating the conditional use be detrimental to or endanger public health, safety, or the general welfare? The memo goes into more detail, but um, in county staff's view, there is a concern about traffic backing up on the Mexico Road. I realize that it can kind of be mitigated by managing the, the, uh, the times that people drop off kids and pick up the kids. 
Um, but at the very least, the, the entrances need to be um, changed so that they meet county highway department standards, not for residential, but for really for commercial. I suppose there's a way for a one, one lane um, circular drop off to work, but at the, at the very minimum, I think that needs to take place. Um, and as you probably know, if you're on an arterial roadway and if there's cars backed up or stopped on that arterial roadway, people aren't expecting that, um, at least not at stoplights. And so that can be a traffic concern or traffic hazard even. Second um, is the use for, uh, of um, portable toilets and hand washing stations. And why I bring that up is that in the building code, it actually doesn't require toilets or um, hand washing um, sinks unless there's a structure involved. So if there's no structure involved and there's only a temporary structure like a tent, there are no minimum requirements for bathrooms or toilet facilities. So really it needs to be addressed through a conditional use permit. So they're, they're obviously offering to provide uh, portable toilets and hand washing stations. And so I think it would be best to address this through any conditions if the, if the Planning and Zoning Commission decided to recommend approval. So let's at least address somewhere. Second, would the conditional use injure the use and enjoyment of other properties in the immediate vicinity for the purposes already permitted? I would say for two months out of the year, um, yes, it would injure the use and enjoyment of other properties in the immediate vicinity. The reason is that the shallow lot depth or the nearness of the other homes and the fact that this particular use is proposed on the front of the lot instead of the back of the lot. If it had been proposed way on the back part of the lot, it would be next to common ground and um, screened by uh, tree, you know, uh, tree stands, but instead it's proposed on the, on the front of the lot. Would the conditional use injure the aesthetic and or scenic values of the vicinity given that there's no structures or grading or removal of trees or vegetation? I would say uh, my recommendation is that you uh, a finding that you have a finding that the proposed conditional use would not injure the aesthetic and or scenic values of vicinity. Would the conditional use substantially diminish or impair property values? We have no data to support that. Would the conditional use impede the normal and orderly development and improvement of surrounding property for uses permitted in the zoning district? And again, we have no evidence that this conditional use would do so. County staff um, recommends that the Planning Zoning Commission recommend denial of the application. Um, but should you choose to, um, obviously whatever course you want to take, it's up to you. Your choices are to recommend for approval with no conditions, recommend approval with conditions, or recommend denial. And should you recommend approval with conditions, we have several conditions <coughs> suggested in the staff report. You can then use that as a starting point for uh, revisions. You can ignore them. It's really up to you. It's just provided for an aid for your, um, for your use. Any questions for staff? Yes, Robert, I have mm -hmm. a question. So we mentioned a couple of times about the shallowness of the adjoining lots. Mm -hmm. In the overhead, and from what I recall, those are relatively new homes. So this was, this was just existing against, uh, you know, essentially a farm or another vacant piece of ground. It was the developer who chose to put those, those property so close to that line, it seems mm -hmm. to me. So I guess, you know, just just an observation sure. that this property was there and these developer put those houses right up against it. Just right. an observation. Thank you. Okay. Well, Mark, I have a question actually. You had mentioned vegetation and such as a barrier between those residential homes and the proposed site, but I don't see that on the list of um, conditions. There's a concept plan. I think it's the very last document in the in the digital document, and it's um, it shows um, two vegetated buffers, one on the west side, one on the east side. Got it. And the, yeah, those being intended to help screen from okay. neighbors. So then that recommendation one, they have to follow this concept plan. That would be the requirement yeah. of the vegetation. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and we're not. 
they're not showing and we're not suggesting that they would carry it all the way down the property line a thousand feet. I mean, that's where it's being shown as next to the, the nearest residences because the, the subdivision in the west, um, as you get farther back in the lot, you're joining the common ground where the subdivision in the west. I see that. Any other questions for staff? Robert, <clears throat> this has been serving as a day camp, day camp farm for a while now. They had what I would call a trial run last summer. And so they do have some experience in how this might work. And so they could address this. Was there uh, any complaints from the neighbors? Yes. I mean, we received calls from uh, multiple directions. You know, we had calls from neighbors. We had calls from parents who said, you know, if this is canceled, I didn't have any alternative childcare for my children. I had calls from people who thought it was just way too hot and there wasn't, you know, the kids are out in the sun and they have no protection from the sun and there's, you know, there's no, uh, um, there's no structures or anything like that. So, we, we, yeah, we received calls about it. But noise or anything like that from the adjacent properties? Uh, I can't remember about noise. I, I can't remember what the calls were about specifically from neighbors. But. Okay. Robert, what? Robert, what happens? I mean, this goes till the end of July. What happens if it gets approved? Does it have to go to next year for reapproval on this? Because it expires after the end on this time yeah. frame. I'm just curious. Well, what, what they could do is once, let's just say this went forward to, to the county council, it got approved. It would take two readings of the county council meeting, and those, um, the bill would be introduced at the, the, the first meeting in June and then act upon last meeting in June. So after that point, once they meet all their conditions, then they could operate the farm camp. So it would be too late for anything in June, certainly. You could, if they wanted to, for this year, they could change the dates to July and August, and then future years do it June and July, but that's really up to them and, and you. Um, and that's, or uh, they could <clears throat> get approval as requested and then just do this in future years. It's a couple so tie in the future years on it then for that for the conditions. Okay. Yeah, because the proposal is just to do this annually. Okay. It's proposed to operate between May fifteenth and August fifteenth. Not in any particular each year. Not in any not this year particularly as it reads. Yeah. It's already addressed in the conditions. Gotcha. Yeah. But it's only attached to the owner of the property. So if they were to sell it, this CUP goes away. Is that correct? No, it actually goes with the land. Once it's established within that two-year time frame, uh, and as long as they follow all conditions, future property owners could could take advantage. Take advantage is not the right word. They could they could operate in conformance with the conditional use permit. Mm -hmm. And if this was approved by us and then approved by county council. I mean, I don't know how they're going to do the concept plan because they're not going to start on it until they have approval. Just doing yeah. the vegetative buffers is going to take some time and putting up the structures that they <coughs> entrances. talking about. Yeah, the entrances. The entrances. Yeah, the entrances, entrances on problem. Mexico Road, honestly, yeah. are the most complicated yeah. in terms of time. So I, don't, I don't know how they can do it even this year, even if it's approved. But anyway, yeah. okay. Any other questions? Anyone else? Okay, well, I see applicants come forward. Okay. Uh, so the applicant's not present, so we will open the public hearing for uh, CUP 22-07. Um, anyone here wishing to speak regarding CUP 22-07, which is a request for a rural re recreation <coughs> activity for a seasonal youth farm camp located on Mexico Road? Anyone? Seeing no one, we will uh, close the public hearing. Okay, so. I make a motion to approve we, CUP 2207. Motion's been made, but I was gonna ask a question because we yeah. just die for lack of a motion, uh, but if we, if it's not approved, then. If it's denied, if, yeah. if we vote. If, if, yeah, if, if, if we deny it, um, can they come? What's the time limit on coming back? Well, uh, should you recommend denial, 
then it would go to the county council with the re that recommendation, yep. and then it would require a uh, super majority, two thirds majority, yeah. in order to overturn that recommendation. All right. Okay. okay. I've got a question too. So, if we would approve it, would all these conditions that you've mentioned automatically become part of that? Yeah. That's up to you. Okay. I just want to make yeah. it clear yeah. be, uh, that because those are proposed, so I just want to make sure that that would be what we would be approved. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You just make okay. the motion to approve with the conditions then. Yeah. yeah. Make it to mo right. Yeah. Exactly. So chair will entertain a motion to approve CUP 20-22-07, uh, including the uh, uh, recommendations proposed by staff. So, right. So moved. Well, Craig, Clerk. Craig, Craig made the motion. Second. I'll second. <laughs> I thought he already did. Yeah, Craig made Mr. <laughs> We've Mr. had two Clark motions on this. Motion. We'll give Mr. Cleary the second. So. Okay, Mr. Shell, how do you vote? No. Uh, Ms. Barr? No. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Cleary? Yes. Mr. Cornwell? No. Mr. Fromm? No. Ms. Kochner? No. Uh, Mr. Baker? No. And I vote no. Okay. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe. Um, now, how do I get it back? This was not letting me go back. Got to hit that back arrow. Uh, you deleted it, didn't you? There we go. <coughs> Who doesn't okay. do that every now and then? Next item on our, our agenda is a conditional use permit amendment request, CUP 23-05. Uh, this is located at uh, 2448 Country Point Lane. <coughs> Property owner, uh, owner is Wanda S. Couch. The applicant is Collective Solutions on behalf of Ameren. Uh, zoning uh, is A agricultural. The parcel size is 6.6 .6 acres. The request is amend the conditions of CUP uh, 112 to allow the replacement of an existing 102 foot communications tower with a 156 foot communications tower. The locations on the south side of Buckner Road, uh, 850 feet west of the intersection of Buckner Road and Highway Z. This is located in Council District 2. Staff. Okay, so this is an application to amend the original uh, CUP, which was approved by the presiding judge of the county in 1980. Uh, the original CUP was for a 102-foot uh, guide tower. Uh, the amendment is requesting to replace that guide tire with a monopole that is 156 feet in height. Uh, they are also requesting two variances on this conditional use permit, uh, a variance to reduce the setback from the height of the tower to 145.3 feet on the eastern side and they are asking to be allowed to have a tower within uh, the one mile radius that we require now this is at 3,000 feet from the tower that we just approved over on highway in uh, mm -hmm. east highway in 29 east highway in so that's the nearest tower um, you know county council does have the authority to make those variances underneath of the uh, cup uh, approval process um, staff does view the following reasons to adjust the county setback and spacing requirements. Uh, the existing land use entitlements that were granted in 1980 allows them to have a tower on site. Uh, the nearest structure is in excess of 300 feet away, so if the tower were to fall, there would be no damage to any surrounding structures. Um, and the use is for Ameren's internal communications only, and it, it is not for any kind of telecommunications purposes, so there should be no interference between those two systems. All right, so the county council can, as part of the CU process, CUP process, amend the setback requirements and the spacing standards as needed for good cause stated and shown. Uh, the stack, staff recommendation is for approval on this amendment with the addition of the following conditions. One, a site plan substantially complying with the detailed site plan as attached hereto <laughs> as part of Exhibit B shall be submitted to and approved by the St. Louis, or the St. Charles County Community Development Department. Two, the maximum height of the monopole shall not exceed 156 feet above grade. Three, the monopole shall have a neutral color that shall be indicated on the site plan. Four, the telecommunications facility shall be enclosed by a minimum of a six foot high security fence. 
Number five, existing vegetation on the parcel shall be maintained so as to continue the screening, the ground to continue screening the ground communication from the public view. Six, the proposed, tele the proposed telecommunications facility shall not be operated until county staff has approved installation of improvements installed in conformance with the approved site plan. And seven, the guide lattice tower shall be removed no later than 14 days following staff approval of the improvements installed in conformance with the approved site plan. Any questions for staff? Seeing none, we will ask the applicant to come forward. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that you'll tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in these proceedings or the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. Please state your name and address for the record. My name is Russell Bean. I am with Selective Solutions. My address is 340 Marshall Road, Valley Park, Missouri, 63088. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Um, do I need to do anything to the presentation? I think you just have to maximize it. There you go. Perfect. Um, Ameren UE, uh, Ameren Electric is proposing a private LTE network on which to operate their internal communications. They're, um, they're substation monitoring, they're, um, they're pole monitoring, and their distribution network monitoring. Also, their meter reading system. Um, prior to now, they've been um, operating their system. They reached the maximum um, allowed on their current system and have had to overflow into um, private cellular networks. Um, this has caused uh, the, the reason for this uh, proposed system um, by, pr by building their own private network, they're allowed unlimited, um, unlimited devices at their own cost. Um, it also uh, supports customer rely reliability um, by monitoring their system, their distribution network through their own system, then they're able to directly um, be notified when uh, there's an outage or an emergency where if they're on a public network, they're not given any priority over any other signal. So someone um, just watching TV on their phone could be given priority over Ameren's signal. So in order to um, get priority to their signal, they're proposing this network. Um, it also helps extend the life of their system. Um, some of you might be familiar uh, when recently all the carriers shut down their 3G <coughs> LTE system. There were a lot of networks, a lot of education networks, and a lot of private security networks that were immediately outdated because they shut down that system. By, um, by allowing Ameren their own system, they'll never be outdated and they'll have the ability to extend the life of their system and then also, if there should be an upgrade needed, have the preparation time in order to do that. Um, and also allows them, you hear a lot about the um, security of the power grid and it also um, allows them to control the security by being on their own private tower. Um, there is an existing 100-foot tower. Uh, it's a guide tower that was put up in 1980. Um, the tower itself is outdated and needed to be replaced. Rather than propose an, um, an additional vertical structure, Ameren proposed um, adjusting the height of this tower to where it would work the, um, obtain their coverage objective that RF needed to um, fit in with their system and then um, allows them to upgrade the tower, which would have needed to be upgraded anyway. Um, in order to, uh, one of the conditions the staff is proposing is to protect the existing ve vegetation. Um, in order to um, put the tower in the best location that would allow us to keep all the existing trees we're proposing on the east side of the existing tower, which puts us 140, I believe 145 feet from the property line rather than 156. So, um, uh, with that in mind and also um, we have to uh, put up the new tower before we take down 
the old tower and the existing guide wires really prevent us from put this, putting this anywhere but where we're proposing. Um, we um, would uh, agree with the staff recommendations and would agree to all the conditions as proposed, um, except for number seven. Um, they are asking for 14 days for the new, uh, for the old guy wire to come down. We'd like to extend that by seven days and would request respectfully that um, that condition be changed to 21 days. Any questions for staff? Or staff, <laughs> any questions for, for the applicant? So the 156, I guess, that they were recommending is to cover the height of the pole, correct? Correct. Yeah, the height of the pole and the um, lightning rod. Right. And so what could the pole be shortened to 142 feet or something like that, a relatively small amount? Well, actually, the, the, the RF coverage objective actually asked for a taller pole. And so we reduced it as much as we could. So we would, I mean, we would respectfully request that we have the 156 feet. They actually wanted 199 foot here, and we had them relook at it to see how short we could possibly go. Any other questions for the applicant? Saying none, thank you, sir. Thank you. We will now open the public hearing for CUP 23-05, uh, Conditional Use Permit uh, <coughs> Amendment Request, located at 2448 Country uh, Point uh, Lane, which is the uh, uh, replacement of an existing telecommunications tower. Anyone here wishing to speak? Come forward. Come on. You solemnly swear or affirm that you'll tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in these proceedings or the pains and penalties of perjury? Yes, sir. Please state your name and address for the record. Uh, my name is Chris McCrellis. My address is 2440 Country Point Lane. Okay, go ahead, sir. Um, so I apologize. I didn't plan on speaking, um, but I wanted to maybe ask a couple of questions. Um, that right now is on real property in the subdivision of Country Point Estates. Uh, I believe when that original conditional use permit was granted back in 1980, I believe you said, uh, that was before a subdivision was there. So this currently stands in the backyard of one of our neighbors. Um, so uh, had questions about the easement that that sits on and what was, what was provided about for that easement and then how things how things look as far as that property still being owned by Wanda Couch and being now part of Country Point Estates subdivision so that property being in the subdivision and owned by uh, Wanda Couch does anything does that property still fall under the restrictions and covenants of uh, Country Point Estates does that make sense I don't know if anyone can answer that for me right now, but. We can't because we don't have those covenants. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I do. <laughs> um, did you bring them? I did not uh, bring them. Yeah. I did send an email, so uh, I did copy that in email. And I, I don't know um, maybe what we would need to do going forward, how we, we would get information on what was granted in that original easement, <clears throat> and then how again how our restrictive covenants govern something like this being that that is property owned in the in the subdivision of country point estates yeah yeah okay, i've got a question so mm -hmm. you're saying that the pole is on someone's lot in the yes. subdivision. that's correct. correct they were granted an easement okay um she owns the property and she pays taxes on the property so therefore uh, in my in my opinion, it is it is it falls within the subdivision. So well, that would depend on how the subdivision was platted if yeah. that lot was included. It is, yes, sir. And also, is there a lease 
arrangement on that, that that property as part of that easement is being leased? I do not have the answer to that. Um, the property owner stated she's not getting any kind of compensation for any of this. She said that the easement was granted prior to her purchasing the property, which would make sense back in 1980. That was before the subdivision was even built. But she does, according to her, own that property. And it is, it is platted, as you can see in one of the pictures that was up there. You can see the property lines go out, and that easement is in the back of her, in the back part of her lot on the back of her property. Okay. Right now, the tower that is currently there um, is visible by maybe two lot owners, maybe three. Uh, it is at the height of the tree line right now, uh, obviously adding another 54 feet to it is going to bring that tower above the tree line and visible to most people in the subdivision. Right. Okay. I'd be curious to hear from the property owner, but she's a yeah, here. Not here. Yeah, anything else? No, that's okay. it. I appreciate Thanks, it. Sir. Yep. Thank you for your time. Anyone else wishing to speak? <clears throat> Anyone? Okay. We, <laughs> we will uh, close the public hearing for CUP 23-05 and has, ask the applicant to come back. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I will tell you this was a perpetual easement um, that was granted in the 1970s, which did indicate that there will be a wireless communications facility in the easement. Um, there are no specifications to the type or how of, um, the, t of the type of telecommunic telecommunication tower. Um, the owner is aware, um, the owner signed the application for us for the conditional use permit. And the owner's not getting compensated at all from Ameren? Do you no, know? Um, it, was a, it was a easement that was bought from the prior the from the property prior, owner. So she knew about it. Okay. Yeah, so it was, yeah, it was there when she bought the property. Yeah. Okay. I mean, aren't you gonna have to have a lot of trucks and things on the property to build this? For, um, for the construction, it'll be your typical tower construction. But we- They're we, not going through her house. Yeah, we have the, we the have the, the, the easement with, runs from the front of the property to right. where the tower is. We, yeah. we have plenty of room to maintain inside our easement during construction. I mean, you can even see from the aerial view, it's kind of treed off a little bit. Yeah, and it really is. I mean, that was our main goal was to maintain the existing tree cover. Sure. Yep. That's, that'd be acres, that property. And, and you're, you're saying you can't provide the service without this tower, without some disruption, even though you can do it on other towers. Is that correct? I, I'm sorry. I'm, so you, you're saying I'm, you can do it now with the current condition. It's just there's disruptions in that network because of how you're doing it on uh, other cell towers. Uh, no, towers. There, we're, we're constructing a brand new network. No, I understand that. Yeah. Yeah, but you're saying you, you're not going to be able to provide. And well, there's, the, um, let me, if you have mind, if I can, I, I don't know how to go back. I'm sorry. That's right. I don't need the technical part of it. But when you, when you said that you were currently doing the service that you want to do with this new tower, that you won't, uh, you won't have any disruption because you're building this tower. Is that, is that what, correct? Well, the, the system that we're building the tower for mm -hmm. is not in existence yet. Okay. This is one of the uh, first 42 towers that are part of this network. Okay. The existing communications that they use, um, if you can see on there, they, they have an existing RF communication system that they're using. That Those antennas will be um, transferred to the new tower um, should the new tower be allowed to be built. So it's other Ameren towers are gonna be transferred to this tower? The, just the one that we're building next to is going the the antenna that's on the top of that tower will yeah, be transferred. I made myself clear. It's okay. I, I, I kind of know. I apologize. That's I'm, okay. I'm yeah. confused. Yeah, that's right. But there's there's 42 new towers, and this is phase one. Yeah. There's 42 new towers 
in the greater St. Louis area, including St. Charles right. County, St. Louis City, St. Louis County, Jefferson County, and Franklin County. And those 42 towers are forming a new LTE network, basically a new cellular phone network. However, it's not gonna be supporting cellular phones, it's gonna be supporting Ameren's monitoring equipment. Right. And that system doesn't come on air until the majority of those 42 towers are built. Then the existing um, RF radio communication that's on that existing tower will still be used because that's how the, the service guys in the trucks communicate. That's gonna be moved to the new tower so that system will be still in place as well. Okay, all right. I have a question. So is the Ameren easement on there, is it some kind of blanket easement that covers the fault line? Or is it possible if that did fall, it's falling onto somebody else's property? Yes, it's possible that that if if it did fall, and I mean you guys heard me up here before, that's not how these towers are designed to fall. But if it would fall like a tree, yes, it would fall into someone else's property. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for the app? Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Now bring uh, CUP 23-05 back to the uh, commission for consideration. Any questions for staff? Any comments? <coughs> Robert? Say, mention one thing um, about the condition to, re to remove the second <coughs> tower within two weeks. That's an arbitrary period of time. Um, that was only intended to ensure that there wouldn't be two, tower, two towers there permanently, that eventually the second tower comes down after the first one, this, I mean, the old tower comes down after the new one gets operational. So what we'd suggest, it could be any time period, really, that you think reasonable. But the other thing, as mentioned, this is the existing tower is a lattice tower, and which with guy wires and the old style, which um, some, you know, the, you know, birds perch on them and they're a little bit different. What's being proposed is a, a monopole, just a pole. And as long as it's a neutral color, it tends to blend in better with the, the sky in the background than the, yeah. the lattice towers do. Um, and in terms of access, as you were talking about, the access to the tower is from Buckner Road. The access to the house is from Country Point Lane. So it's not like there'll be driving on Country Point Lane in order to access this property to put up the new tower. It'll be off of a, a gate coming from Buckner Road. Any questions, comments? And, uh, I noticed the comments, uh, unless I'm missing something, did not include that fall line of the 145. Uh, but there is a, is there any comment on that from the county staff? Uh, no, I, if I was reading the, the, the drawing correctly, um, the, wa the lot's not really wide enough. If the tower's going to be 150 feet tall, the lot's really not wide enough to have a fall distance. I mean, if you put it in the center of the property, I don't, I think it, if it, yeah, technically if it failed, it'd be, it'd be yeah. fell like a tree, it would be over the line like 10 feet or something. Mm -hmm. But I don't think you can move the tower anywhere on site to meet that 100 and whatever it would be, 156, 150 foot um, setback. So just because of the lot narrowness alone, that's a factor in the, not being able to meet the setback. From the report, gotcha. the closest structure is more than 300 feet away. Right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Anything else, Robert? No, sir. Okay, Chair will entertain a motion to approve CUP 23-05, which is to amend the conditions of CUP uh, 112 to allow the replacement of an existing 102-foot communications tower with a 156-foot <coughs> communications tower, uh, subject to the conditions uh, proposed by staff with condition seven reading the existing guide lattice tower shall be removed no later than 21 days following county staff approval of improvements installed in conformance with the approved site plan. Is there a motion? Motion. Ms. Parr makes the motion. Is there a second? I second. 
Ms. Kushner, right you second. Mr. Fromm, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Cornwell? Yes. Uh, Mr. Clary? Yes. Uh, Mr. Shell? Yes. Ms. Kushner? Yes. Uh, Ms. Barr? Yes. Mr. Baker? Yes. And I vote yes. Okay. Thank you. Back. Okay. We have our tabled items. Next item on the agenda is the uh, approval of the minutes from the uh, April 19th, 2023 regular meeting. Uh, is there any additions to the deletions, corrections to the minutes? Seeing none, Chair, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes. Motion. Is there a second? Second. All in favor of approving the April 19th, 2023 uh, meeting minutes, uh, sign aye. 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 Okay, minutes are approved. Um, planning and zoning update? The only thing I wanted to mention was, as, as um, briefly discussed at the last meeting, our next meeting will have a very large mailing for notifications. At this point, there are more than 3,000 letters. Now, I would say that Quite a, few, a lot of those letters, there's going to be two letters in one envelope. So it's only going to, I don't know how many households, but it's a lot. <laughs> uh, we're setting up, I don't know if it's three or 500 chairs in the family arena. So our next meeting will be at the family arena and it will start at 7 p.m. We'll have um, one, if not two, new planners by that time. So all of our staff will be there. <coughs> Uh, in order to do everything from, we're gonna have a, um, an orientation table set up front and county staff will man it and say, here's a speaker's card. There's gonna be a three minute time limit. According to what uh, Roger's indicated, we're gonna impose the three minute time limit that was approved as part of the uh, uh, procedures of the Planning and Zoning Commission, so. So we'll only be there for seven hours. Well, is it too late to move it to six? Or could we move it to six? I mean, have letters been sent out yet? I think, aren't you worried about people not being able to make it or something? Yeah, we talked about that. Would it be possible to consider breaking it up into two meetings? <laughs> well, I mean, well, if it's six or seven hours, I don't know. That yeah. I hope it's not gonna be. It's not gonna right, be. it's hard to know whether, That's how true. long the, the meeting's gonna be, yeah. but. I'm just joking. You can. Um, <laughs> It's up to the, the chairman and the commission, but you could always adjourn the meeting and, and readjourn later, I think. You know, if it's, if it's 2 a.m., you don't have to keep going, I don't think. I don't think there's a requirement to do so. So how many um, things do we have for the agenda besides the 3,000 homes we're sending out to? What else? Is, do we have anything else for the agenda? I think we've got approximately 12 or 13 uh, applications for the meeting. So wow. It's going to be a lot. Yeah. But you know what, it's, it's possible that one of the properties, which includes a subdivision, a conditional use permit, and a rezoning, it's one of those that has all three. Right. It may not be ready for the next meeting because they still have some work to do in their plats. So it's potentially, it could, that could get moved forward to, um, what would that be, the right. July meeting. So it's still not all set in stone in terms of of how big our agenda is going to be that night, but I would plan on having a big agenda. Okay. Okay. Um, I was going to sort of take a, a, a straw poll as to who will be here uh, for the June meeting. We already know one's got a really sort of sorry excuse. It's a wedding, <laughs> her wedding anniversary, so we're going to let her go. What? Is anybody, anybody else what planning on being here? here? Yes. Okay, because I, what I hate, would hate was we get one short of a right. quorum with 500 people at the fish Sure. <laughs> yeah. Sad to plan on my family vacation, right? So I'll be there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually leaving the next day, so <laughs> we're getting out of there. <laughs> Early. <laughs> Maybe I'll just go to the airport <laughs> from the meeting. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we'll just uh, you we'll, you just get an Uber to the airport from Family right. Arena. I guess I can do it. <laughs> I mean, if necessary, I guess technically. No, no. Anything I else? That. Anything else? <laughs> Anything else, Robert? We're good to go. Okay. I'll make um, a motion to adjourn. Okay. Motion second. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, uh, motion remains second to mm -hmm. adjourn. All in favor, sign aye. 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 aye.